Well, now is not the time to want to be in the live theater business, or is it? Yeah. Well, it could be, you know, like we've talked about uh, a couple times recently that, you know, in addition to this chaos that uh, the current situation is bringing in businesses and especially theater and and large crowds, you know, there's going to be all kinds of opportunities, right? There is. And uh, we've we've spent the last... I, I want to say four episodes of our, I do a podcast for working musicians called gig gab. As you can imagine, oh, yeah. it, the focus is now very different right now. And, and sure. a lot of it has been on exactly that opportunity. What, what yep. does exist right now and what can you be doing to prepare for later? And that's what our guest yeah, today it, is kind of doing. Yeah, he's, in the theater that's world. right. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to have, I mean, it's it's great. We're going to learn a lot about a business that I know nothing about. And he, we're also going to see some uh, real creativity in action about how to adapt and how to tap into a market that, you know, used to come to you and now you may have to come to them. So yeah. it's, it's going to be a great show. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, for sure. Hey, I want to talk about our first sponsor, which is Text Expander. Man, Shannon, I don't know about you. In fact, I do know about you. I know that you're like me and you couldn't live without Text Expander. That's right. We are spending all of our time on our computers when we're working now. Like we're definitely, you know, not interacting with humans in person. So it's all via our computers. We're typing more to people. We're doing all kinds of more email, more texting and all that. And I think there's, you know, right now everybody is tolerant of mistakes, typos, errors, things like that. But that's not going to continue for very long. Uh, And even right now, the people that are sending well-crafted messages are the people that are going to stand out and shine and succeed in this crazy thing that we've got going on. And Text Expander is built for exactly this because we need to be efficient. We need to be moving quickly, but we also need to maintain all of that accuracy. We don't want to have to stop and proofread the same thing over and over again. And this is what Text Expander lets us do. We create snippets of text, we put them into Text Expander, and then we can invoke them at any point in time with a quick keystroke or a click of the mouse. And boom, this text that we have crafted is out there and it can be long stuff, many paragraphs. It can be your phone number, your email address, a greeting, a thank you, something, anything. You can do this right inside Text Expander. You got to go check this out. It's available for Mac OS, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, iPad. TextExpander.com slash podcast is where you're going to go. That gets you 20% off your first year. And our thanks to Smile and Text Expander for sponsoring this episode. Good stuff, man, right? Yeah, I agree, man. Couldn't live without it. Couldn't live without it. All right. Well, he is Shannon Jean. I am Dave Hamilton. And this is episode 271 of The Small Business Show. When consumers saw Enron in London, they were looking at the play and saying, look at those Americans and how they destroyed the world. When Americans Uh, saw New York, they said, (laughs) I don't want to see this right now. It hits too close to home. Oh, too soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's a lot of it has to do with timing, right? Uh, sure. You know, in, in, are you, you know, because you're asking people to pay a lot of money for their time and you want to say something that they care about. Sure. Yeah. That, that totally makes sense. So from a creative sense, so like on a physical production side, you know, the, the industry works the way it does, right? There isn't, they're like, we, 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 we built an industry around how we produce these plays. And there was a certain amount of like, they cost what they cost. Costs are always escalating. This is just what this industry is. Hey, Dave, you know, we're in the middle of this big disruption here and and everything has changed in every aspect of our lives, especially related to business. And one of the things that I've I've read about lately is, you know, how automation and AI are changes everything is going to change, you know, virtually every business. But one area that uh, I've been reading about that uh, often authors will say, well, this area is kind of protected is the creatives, artists, content producers that need that human touch. Uh, and so I had, you know, a question about how do you go about creating a successful business built around creativity, uh, things like theatrical experiences, yeah. great content. 
And I'm really happy to have uh, David Carpenter here with us today. He's the founder of Tilted Windmills Theatricals and his new business, uh, Gameotics. And he's going to share his experience as a producer of traditional theater, as well as some new stuff that he's working on. And we're also going to talk about you know, audience participation, how we kind of get back there. So thanks so much for joining us today, David. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm, I'm really interested. I know nothing about your business other than from a spectator. And I'm, I'm, I, I love that kind of stuff. So it's, it's great. I'm, I'm excited to learn. So along that lines, I want to learn about both of your companies today. L- let's start about, uh, let's start with Tilted Windmills. Tell us what your business does uh, and a bit of history, if you will. Oh, no, sure thing. So uh, Tilted Windmills was founded about a little over five years ago. It was founded between me and uh, my former business partner, John Pinkard. Uh, and we basically set out to start a theatrical production company. Um, and, you know, we, our eye and our relationship with the industry, uh, by that point, we've been kind of at it for about 15 years. Uh, we wanted to see what we could develop and do together and, and try and you know, like every new startup in any industry is trying to be disruptive and try to, you know, change the game a little bit in, in what it is that we were doing. Um, and so we, we just kind of boldly in the January, 2015, uh, said, all right, well, let's give it a shot. And we found some startup capital, uh, and, and just started, you know, Optioning works and moving things forward. Um, we uh, failed miserably for eighteen months at everything we touched. Um, uh, several product projects during that time period just absolutely imploded. Um, and the original seed capital uh, that we'd found, who had agreed to fund us for a year, after about eight months, kind of got bored and wandered off. Uh, and I, I was like, as as sometimes it does, is you can have an investor who's all gung ho, and then. They hit the middle of the summer and said, well, I want to go do something else and, you know, sue me for it. Right. And that's basically what happened. (laughs) So so that was our year one. Right. Um, And so we were um, we had a real we had had a a really long, serious talk at that point about trying to figure out what we're going to do. We sat down and we decided that we needed to recapitalize the company. And so we went through that kind of three month period uh, where you know we couldn't pay ourselves, we didn't you know we, you know bills started stacking up, and we just kind of forged ahead as best we could. And during that time period, we found a property um, in that was in December of 2015 called Puffs. And what Puffs is is that it's a original comedy that takes place in a world that is similar to a world you know, but it's not that world. And basically, it's a parody of 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 the seven Harry Potter books on from huh. the theatrical stage, right? And um, effectively, it's it, it, it's absolutely legally 100% classified as a parody. No, no question about that. Um, it, and it it takes the point of view of these three kids who are in magic school, right? It's called the uh, um, uh, a certain school of magic and magic, right? Is the name of the school. And these three friends who meet in their first year of magic school um, uh, come together to fight evil, and it turns out they're all just terrible wizards, right? And during the course of the of these seven years uh, that they're in magic school, there's this other kid who, who wanders in and out of the story who is very popular, and he is the hero of the school. And kind of the point of that show was that you can you need to learn how to be the hero of your own story, right? Stop. Ah, oh, sure. Stop, yeah. And we so, we so say that all the time part. here. Yeah, yeah we, we love that here. Yeah. Yeah. So we found you know, my, my, my former business partner, John, had found Puffs and he invited me down to see it. And I, I took a look at it and I was like, yeah, we should option this. We have $5,000 in our bank account right now. Now, we knew at that moment in time that more capital was coming in very shortly. But our, literally our net assets at that point was $5,000. Right. And so we we decided to take a huge risk and we got a first order refusal on that script. Um and we went to the authors and the team who'd done it. It was done done down at the People's Improv Theater. And we said, look, we want to try and figure out how to transfer it off Broadway. We want to take we want to take the script. And we optioned it the day before its New York Times review came out, which was a rave. So so that works. <laughs> um, yeah. um, and so then we spent the next eight months trying to figure out how to get it up on Broadway. So we had our we had some new run of uh, investment capital and we worked through it the rest of the year. And um, and pulled that show together while well, a couple of other shows still fell apart during that same time period. And um, and by October of 16, 
we launched the show and it was a hit out of the gate and it ran for three years in New York, played two different theaters. Um, and it's turned into this like international hit show. It's one of the top licensing titles in Sam French right now, or was, oh, yeah. um, um, and it's done, I produced it in Australia. I, I, I produced it. Um, uh, I produced the film of it. We filmed the stage show and I own the movie. I own the filming rights to it. So that is available on iTunes and Amazon and that's its own revenue generator. I, I, I am the publisher of the script. So I sell the script. Nice. And so, and so we built this little business around puffs and, and in that, in doing so kind of reinvent reinvented the approach to off Broadway because the sh- it was a play that had 11 people in the cast, right. Which yeah. was an enormous thing. And everyone told us there was no way we were going to be able to do it. We ended up doing it very successfully. So part of what the company was built on was um, was this reinvention in, in doing that show and then our subsequent continuing producing of that show. That's good for awesome. you. So, that's, yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. I mean, it, good start. It, it is, <laughs> yeah. well, and it, 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 what an, what an example for any small business owner, you know, as soon as you're going to start any venture, you will have people, especially if you're doing something that's a little bit different, which is what most small business owners do is find a different way of getting the same thing done. And that's where your that's where your profits exist. That's where your niche is. And you'll have a million people telling you you can't do it. And and the reminder that we always try and, and reinforce here is, no, they're telling you they can't do it. Not that you can't. do Right. It. Right. So just yeah. go do it. Yeah. Yeah, and I also and I also think that your first venture like that is is basically your can be your grad school education. It can, you know, <laughs> not, 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 not probably not nearly as good as yeah. an MBA, right? But but it, but it can really it teaches a lot of things. And one of the things that I learned throughout the throughout the three four years that I was the lead producer, and I still am the producer of the show because um, uh, I still retain the rights right now. But but uh, the year is that. I learned a lot about a lot about copyright and, and international uh, copyright and, and trademark and IP law. Yeah. Because from day one, I was under constant, constant legal threat, um, um, angry, nasty, mean legal threat on a constant basis. Right. But the U.S. laws are very well defined. They're, they've been adjudicated in the courts many times when it comes to parity, when it comes to transformative work. And we were. What we had, we had a show, right, that took place, that was original comedy that took place in its own little world, right? But it was parroting this world that for certain points of view was parroting another world that's about being bullied, right? right. And it's about being bullied in school. And I spent three years being bullied. And that's the one thing yeah. that you do when you're bullied, which we, which we, me and my, my phenomenal attorney and I did was every time they hit us, we would just hit back. Um, and that was that. Right. And so, you know, there are restrictions to what I can do with it on a global basis. Um, and I don't really have to kind of get into all of it right now. But within the U.S., you know, we play by the rules. Right. Sure. And and what I would say to any entrepreneur or anyone working in does any in theater is all about IP. Right. And intellectual property is don't break the rules. <laughs> like, don't do it. You want to sure. play in, you want to start playing around with IP, do it the right way. Get it, set it up correctly from day one. And I, yeah, so and we got lucky but, in doing it. Out. Yeah. And let, let me ask you, when you describe, you know, bringing these things, you know, from a concept or licensing and getting it, everything going, it seems to me like you're almost starting a new business every single time. I mean, is that a, a, a good description? So every, every Broadway show, every off Broadway show, and I'm not talking about nonprofits, right? I'm talking about, I'm talking about the commercial world. Sure. Every single one of those shows is a venture that requires you to sell equity in it to groups of investors um, and, and your return is based on box office sales, you know, and, and it's simply that. And it's a slightly ridiculous model in this day and age, but it still works and it's still holding up to a degree. Right. Mm. But every single one of those shows is a company unto itself that it has its own management structure that has right. its own contractors right. and employees yeah. and its own set of investors. Right. So every time you produce a show, you launch a new venture. Now, the difference in our world versus the difference in, you know, in, in, Silicon Valley and tech startups is that you scalability is a very different concept for us, right? And, and for theater people and that you are, there are no, there are unicorns, right? And our unicorns are Hamilton or book of Mormon or, sure. 
or you know cats or phantom right those are are theatrical but they they play out very slowly over time as opposed to something that blows up within three to five years that's right hey that's a good way to look at it that's right yeah because it does yeah yeah, a, a successful theater show it takes time in order to actually realize that success. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's because we're tied to real estate as a business because well, you can't yeah. have a show without being in a piece of real estate. And that right. real estate has to be available. It has to be appropriate. It has well, and, to and you have you know, be in the right markets. Yeah. Limited inventory that you can sell any given day. And so right. you, you, you have to just extend it out. Time is your friend in, in as long as people still want to come. Time is your friend. Right. So, yeah, so if you, you look at something like Hamilton, which sells and I'm making this up. I don't actually know the right number because it's not sitting in front of you. But it's like they can sell twelve hundred seats a night. Right. Sure. So times eight. That's their that's their weekly. That's it. That's all they can do in a week. You know, there's a billion people on Facebook right now. So like that's where our scalability is really different. Right. In that we are closer to. The airline industry, although they have way more inventory than we than we do, but we're sure. closing the airline industry uh, in the yeah. regard of like once the performance has happened and the seat has been unsold, you can never get that piece of inventory yeah, it's, back. It's expiring inventory, and you were close. Yeah. It, the Richard Rogers Theater is thirteen nineteen. So ah, there you wow, go. Well, you're, well done, well done. Right. <laughs> so, but like, but but an expiring inventory industry is 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 specific. Right. Like, oh, it's, yeah. it's a well, we're, it's a, we're it's in a that it's we're in that one. business here yeah. because once this episode goes, I, I guess we could, in theory, come back and like reinsert an ad or something. But, you know, in general, the ad business is also expiring inventory in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So let, let me ask you this. Uh, I mean, when you're putting together these productions and you have to get investors and do all this kind of stuff, uh, you know, are you solving the, the same types of problems over and over um, or, you know, is is it each production has its own unique set of barriers that you have to you know power through art is subjective right so i mean part of the part of the problems with selling commercial art is that you have to be saying the right thing at the right time to the right people in order to make a sale right so like like you are so like one of my favorite examples right of 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 how you can do everything right and it can go right and wrong within the same season um, was a play that happened a number of years ago called Enron, right? And Enron was a play that I believe Lucy Preble, Preble wrote it, was about, it was, she wrote a play that took all of the public information about the fall of Enron, right? That you could get off of any news item or any website or anywhere. And she created a narrative around it and, and kind of documented this fall of Enron and how Enron, you know, in 08 destroyed um, the world, basically. Yeah, the, you know, they, they were, they were the, yeah. right, right? And so... And so the play premiered in London and it was a massive hit, right? Just massive, massive, massive hit. And, it, and, and you know, we, we sold out one Olivier's, I think, I don't know. Um, but anyway, they transferred it into Broadway and it closed after two weeks, right? Oh, wow. And normally within, within our worlds, right? You know, you can predict success like Les Mis was a hit in London. It can will be a hit in New York. Right. Like that is not a hard that's not a stretch. And we we because those are the two major markets, you see a lot of things cross back and forth. The interesting thing about Enron that that makes this such a high risk category of investment. And in what we do is that when consumers saw en- Enron in London, they were looking at the play and saying, look at those Americans and how they destroyed the world. When Americans uh, saw it yeah. in New York. They said, I don't want to see this right now. It hits too close to home. Oh, too and it soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's a lot of it has to do with timing, right? Uh, sure. You know, in, in, are you, you know, because you're asking people to pay a lot of money for their time and you want to say something that they care about. Sure. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So, so from a creative sense, so like on a physical production side, you know, the, the industry works the way it does. Right. There isn't they're like we, we, we built an industry around how we produce these plays. And yeah. there is a certain amount of like they cost what they cost. Costs are always escalating. This is just what this industry is. So right. you can solve a lot of problems technically. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, will people like this enough to buy tickets and, and tell their friends to go buy tickets? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. I think that, uh, you know, especially right now, you know, it, it, everything's changed, right? Everything's so different. And not like normally I would be asking you, oh, yeah, trends, things change. How do you adapt? You know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, th- the big thing I think about now is how, you know, does your industry and your business, and maybe this leads us into talking about, you know, gameotics and and how you're, you're sure. setting up new things. Uh, 
how, how are, you know, you're, what are you planning on doing to adapt, you know, as a business that brings large groups of people together, you know, how is, what's the, the narrative and, and the framing going on in, within your industry of how, how we're going to, going to recover and come back from this? Well, unfortunately right now there, there isn't one, right? Like there is, there is always a lot of hopeful optimism about how, about how theater can perform, right? And how, what theater sure. can do. And I worked on Shrek the Musical in 08. Um, my office looked at Lehman Brothers. I kid you not. Like, oh. I, I uh-huh. still to this day remember standing at my window watching people walking out of Lehman Brothers with boxes in their hands and all of us sitting in the DreamWorks office at that point saying, well, this is going to be a problem, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, but what we learned is that, you know, Broadway is a luxury is a luxury good, right? But it's a luxury good that people feel they can't be without. The same thing it goes for off Broadway. It's like people need live entertainment in their lives in right. order to feel human. It is a necessary part of what they need. Yeah. They might buy less, right? Which is what we experienced, right? Then they did, but they won't stop buying, right? So I don't think that any of us are worried that Broadway is not going to come back. I think the challenge sure. right now is how, because after September 11th, Broadway reopened in two days, yeah. okay? And, and there was a big national commercial about everybody go to New York, Right. And it was all about go to New York, go to New York, support, support New York. Right. 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 They built the entire, you know, World Trade Center Memorial around the idea of people around this whole idea. And it kept New York in the zeitgeist and as a place to go. So when the collapse for us happened, the biggest warning sign was the week before, because like most people don't know that they pu- publish our, our grosses on a weekly basis publicly. Right. You can see how each show on Broadway is doing every week. Right. And the, the canary in the coal mine that week was Lion King and Phantom had some of the worst weeks that any of us could remember seeing, right? And Lion King and Phantom are two shows that rely tremendously on out-of-town audiences mm. coming in to see it, right? Oh, okay. So, so if we the, – the, the statistics are something like 70% of the audience for Broadway shows comes from outside of New York, right? So it's a mix of international tourism and domestic tourism, right, who are coming to see the shows. A lot of it is domestic tourism. And, you know, in this particular instance, so we, we shut down on the 15th of March and all travel to New York has been canceled. It takes months and months to rebuild back people's schedules to plan a trip to New York. So there were people who've been planning for a long time to come to New York in March who canceled. So when will they come back? Will it be next March? Right. Like, yeah, will it be the know. fall? And that's the thing that we don't know, which is. Which is, so that is the big unknown right now, which is like, I have no doubt that Broadway is going to come back. And I have no doubt that they're going to go after as much local audience as they can. But it's a question of when are we allowed to gather as groups like that? Right. And when is the state going to allow us to gather as groups like that? And then how do we build an audience that is had that has to look different than the audience we had on March 14th? Yeah. And, and is the, are those discussions going on, like, you know, among you and your peers and connections that, you know, or is, is that kind of the, OK, how are we going to do yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, that's yeah. all the discussions. But it's yeah. but you don't know. I mean, the, the big unknown is, is there it, when and if yeah. they're an audience, an audience when will appear. Back. Yeah, I, I yeah. think it's it's very smart to think of it along the lines of we got to tune this to local first to to start this and and then you know slowly as we as we ramp back up. Yeah, I think that's smart. I, I, I think the thing also that 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 is like like all businesses, but but, but Broadway is particularly cash sensitive, right? It, they don't keep a lot of money on hand, and so you know our running costs the 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 difference between our weekly running costs and our and our profit our profitability. Can you know can be anywhere from a hundred thousand dollars to five hundred thousand dollars, right? It just kind of depends on how the, the the running expenses of a show is set up, right? Sure. Right. So you can only run a show at a loss for so long before you've evaporated any cash you have sitting there, and that's I think a big question of saying, yeah. all right, we can come back, but if the audience takes a month to come back, right after we start, like if it takes that long, will I have enough cash? If it takes three months, to make will anybody have yeah, enough sure. cash? Yeah, I mean that's and so a lot of those discussions are happening. So I think that there's a lot of you know, hopefully, and I don't know this to be certain, but I would hope that the leaders in our industry are looking at the government saying, you've got to put some sort of fund together. It doesn't even, you know, in order to allow us to continue as an industry or, you know, we're a, we're a multi-billion yeah. dollar industry. Supporting in the, the arts, so, of course. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, that totally makes sense. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree. So, okay. I also want to talk about this 
this new venture. Now that we've got some background right. on kind of your traditional business and stuff, which is, which is fascinating. It sounds like a complete nightmare to me, <laughs> but I'm, I'm so glad people like you figured it out because I love to go to shows. Um, but let's talk about gameotics and, and yeah. the input, the, how you, how that came about, uh, you know, where it's at in development right now and just, what is it and what does the future hold? Sure. So a, a few years ago, we had found a show that the audience would walk in, they would be, they would be handed handheld remotes, right? And during the course of the show, and the show was a, this rom-com, right? About a guy going out on a date with a girl, right? But the audience got to make the decisions on his date at 15 various points during the show that led to eight or 10 different endings, right? And so all the decisions were rated on a point system. It was a fairly simple uh, gaming um, uh, uh, idea built into it, where if they voted really well for the guy, if he, gave, if he said every right thing throughout the course of the show, then he slept with the girl at the end. And if he said every bad thing, then he threw himself off a bridge because she rejected him, right? And everything in between. <laughs> right. And it's it was like a really life. interesting, right? <laughs> exactly, right? It was a really interesting concept, right? Now, we optioned the show, but we couldn't really make the show itself work for a variety of reasons. It just wasn't, it wasn't a good enough show at that point, which is ironic. Uh, remind me to come back to this at the end of the conversation, right? What, when I took a look at it, the audience got really excited about the idea that they had agency in theater. And so it was this way to, per, to do a new take on immersive theater. And so I got really excited about it. And uh, uh, through a series of interesting events, we met these guys out in San Diego, one of whom is a guy named Dave Keene, who is who at one point in his career was a senior architect of the uh, PlayStation Gaming Network. And, we, and, and oh. it, the timing was fortunate because we were trying to figure out a way to create technology that that was on your phone. Right. So that we didn't have to hand anything to the audience when they walked in the door, because when you are having to provide things to audience when they walk in, you immediately cut off your scalability, right? right. Because you're you sure. a burden, right? You've added to your expense and now you just have this thing, right? That the audience, right? And so, you know, my first instinct was, let's put this on the cell phone and let's figure out a way to do it. Everyone's got a cell phone, right? right. And, and the, the second thing, you know, I created a series of rules around this. And I said, look, the second thing is it cannot be an app. You can never ask a consumer, a theater consumer, oh, right. to download yeah. an app to enjoy a theatrical experience. And I call it the 802 rule. The 802 rule was if it's raining and it's 802 and you arrive to the theater and you're late and you're angry and pissed off, if an usher stops you and says, download this app to enjoy the show, you've lost the consumer from moment one. I love right? the but 802 the usher, rule. I, I'm uh, definitely going to I'm going to apply that to so many. I, I'm a drummer in theater at times. And and yeah. that that 802 rule solves so many problems when you just point it to someone like that and say, look, here's the thing. Perspective matters. You can't do this. That's right. Yeah. I love it. And, that, that's, and that's the thing is, that, and I said, and for this, and for, for working on your cell phone, I said, it's got to be two clicks and in. I think it now probably has to be three clicks, but it's going to be two clicks and in, meaning like go to this website, enter this code, boom, then you're, and then you're ready to go. And so what the software ended up being developed into was this ability to talk with consumers in real time throughout the course of the show. Right. And it started as this AB choice module, right. In that, in that, in order, and we developed it along these lines in that the actor's the script would be the script would be a adventure where the audience can decide things um, throughout the course of the show in order to impact the narrative and the outcome, right? And so you're you would reach a decision point in the show. Does the character do A or does the character do B? And the audience then would would vote, right? Sure. And the, nice. the way that it worked is that the question was projected on stage. What do you want to do? The answers were immediately served up to your phone. So it was just pushed right up to your phone. They voted. The votes tallied in real time. So like 300 people sitting in a room were making a choice between A and B, and they're watching a bar graph go up in real time. And the, we call them elections, right? The, the choice sequence is an election. Happened within eight seconds. So it's happening really fast as the audience is voting. And then by the end of the election, whatever got the most votes... That's what the actors That's the would do, way. and they just go. Yeah. And it became That's just, nice. and we made it seamless into the integration of the of the of the experience, right? Um, so over the course of time, so that business, and I'm, I'm getting to how Gamiac started. That business was the original plan for us within Tilted was that was that that business that we were going to develop a show that use this technology and that we own this technology kind of outside the business, but the show then uses technology. We're going to produce that show because that oh, was that the, our approach. Is right. Sure. 
<clears throat> last year, the show didn't get there. And, and it's not the show's fault. Um, I have firsthand knowledge now of how hard it is to create this type of narrative, right? It's really, really hard. You know, it's like, especially when you're looking in a live theatrical environment, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah it have so, to be entertaining. So yeah, you've got to have right? so many different and story yeah. angles that are all entertaining, each entertaining, we, really. Yeah, We are going to get there. <laughs> we are going to get there in one yeah. second, right? So, so, but when we were developing that show, because we did a series of, of seven readings over nine weeks just to try, because the other thing too, is if your story is branching or it had, or different things happen, depending on the audience reaction, you can't develop it in a vacuum. Your audience has to tell you what's working and what's not working. Right. Right. Um, sure. Right. Right. So it's so the traditional theatrical development process of we do a reading and then maybe we do a workshop and then we put like and then there's a preview period. doesn't work for this. There's a it's a way different, much more intensive way of developing the product. Right. Sure. Anyway, so we did these readings and the show didn't quite get there. But the technology took a massive leap forward because for whatever reason, our Dave Keen um, just had a lot more time on his hands during that time period. And so he developed all these other functions for the technology that it moved from a B choicing to multi-click elections, to the Simon Says, where the audience has to remember the sequence that we've given you, to a tug-of-war sequence. And then we created this thing called a voter isolation, where if someone makes a, sh a choice at one moment in the show, we can actually, if, if say there was a choice saying, do you want to do yes or no, the 50 people who chose yes, we can isolate a single user out of those 50 people, and then they get to make the next choice by themselves. So like all That's of this, cool. That's not, cool. right, really yeah. cool stuff yeah. started happening, right? Um, so... So that ha that was at the beginning of the summer and we realized that we were working on a platform and we started trying to figure out how we put the venture together as a platform. Now, a couple other things happened um, over the course of the summer. We had a workshop that kind of fell apart on us, um, which really changed the dynamics of our business. And then we produced our first Broadway show. I was a lead producer on the Slava Snow Show this past Christmas, which is a great success. But during that time period, uh, John and I decided to part ways. Um, and all fine, but we just decided we're going to go in different directions. And one of the things is this, this technology has been something that I've been really driving at. And I've, I never really had the time because I was doing so many other projects and the running Puffs Inc. and all this that I was like, look, I'm going to take the company, but really all I'm going to do is game is, is do game audits. And, okay. and, and the result of John and I's breakup freed me from the tilted operating agreement. Now tilted still exists as a company. Um, uh, but it allowed me to basically form another company because I couldn't form a technology platform company inside tilted windmills. There was just no sense. way I could finance it. Sure. Right? Like it, it sounds like, happen. yeah. And it sounds like going forward that that's really where your, your future efforts are going to be focused on this game. Yotics platform. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I'm still running nice. puffs. So I got a Slavis tour to put out at some point. Like I got, a, huh? I got other theatrical projects too, that's cool. but the, but I, at the top of the year in, when I went to the reorg of the company, um, and John's withdrawal, I then sat down and wrote an entire new business plan for Gameotics, right? And so um, I, February, put the business plan together, I vetted it through the investors and I started getting commitments. I started getting a lot more commitments starting in, in March. And what the plan was is that I was going to continue developing the technology, but really put a play together that showcased yeah. the technology plus the content and premiere it at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, right? This summer. Huh. And I had commissioned it it was starting work on it and it was all going forward until march 4th then yeah, yeah. And, 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 then, and now here we are then, that's right yeah yeah so, no, no. so i say march 14th because march 15th march the evening of march 14th is when they announced that uh broadway theaters would shutter um uh for at least a month and now that's gonna i don't i don't think we're gonna see broadway reopen until the summer at this point if that uh, yeah, um, I, I, so, I it wouldn't agree. surprise me if it was next summer uh, when when we can get, you know, thousands of people together again, uh, although I guess Broadway could open and theaters could be half full or a third. Full yeah, or I think like that's that. what, there's going to be some sort of phased in. At least I, I hope that that's kind of the 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 methodology that there's some kind of phased in thing, because I, I, back to your original point, you know, David, is, you know, we. We humans, we want to get together. We want to experience shared things and theaters are, you know, a really important part of it and those kinds of experiences. Uh, so I hope that's the way we go. So uh, my, so, so here, so here's, so here's what happened on March 17th, right? In that capital markets collapsed, right? No one's out there. If anyone, anyone who is able to secure financing right now, right? 
we're probably far enough along with solid enough people that that they can that it keep going. Everybody else like me who was just launching and doing my pre-seed round stopped, yep. just full stopped, right? Like, no, there's no, sure. like, cause I was, and then look, I was doing a pre-seed round. It was like my company's investors, investors in other shows, members of the community, everybody thrown in, you know, $10,000, $25,000, whatever it is to get me to a little over a half million dollars, right? To get me through this year because I'm really in proof of concept mode right now, right? Sure. The March 17th, it's like, okay, there's no money coming, right? I am recapitalizing my business at the worst possible moment in time. Um, my writers who I had commissioned were no longer writing because they weren't getting paid, right? So I sat there for a week, like I think a lot of people did. And panic isn't the right word because that really wasn't a week of panic. It was a week of, you wake up every day thinking you had a plan. And then by the end of the day, you're like, well, that didn't happen. Right. <laughs> like, of like, to the basics of like, I didn't shower today. Like just nothing happened the way you wanted yeah. to plan it that week. Right? But what I recognized at that moment in time was that to your point, we have a human need to get together and we're going to be robbed of it for quite some time. And I have this technology that allows people to come together to do an immersive experience. Right. I needed right. to start building content. And, and so right. what I, and then the second part of it is like, the only thing that's going to get me through this is to keep working because I have to come up because if I can produce something reasonably smart and good on the other side of this, then it should logically speaking, lead me back on my path of finding and, and solidifying investment um, in, into this technology company. Right. Because the idea is that I'm creating an immersive experience for the live stage in a scalable model, right? That anyone can do these shows if they license the content and the tech, right? And it can be done anywhere. And I was building a content library in order, in order to put this idea in the world and put this technology out in the world of saying, here's a really simple, straightforward way for your consumers to have real-time interaction with the stage or the, or the show or the event, right? Without it costing the consumers anything and costing the licensor very little to execute, right? Because sure. like you want, I want to put a product that everybody would use, right? Yeah, makes sense. And and so now what we're doing um, after that week of of that, I sat down and I turned to my husband. And I said, "Well, we have no money, um, and and or we have, we have enough money to get through this time period, but I can't hire writers." we're going to write the first one and see what happens. And so we called cool. our friends together and said, let's just start doing this and I'll pay you as much as I can afford. And let's see what this thing is. And so for the last two weeks, um, Jacob and I have just been killing ourselves every day, turning ourselves into writers, which we are, we are avid consumers of entertainment and like we could take anyone down about structure. Right. But having to do it ourselves is a whole new world. And right. we're now starting to put these together. And so what's really the interesting thing as I'm coming to this week is we, we had another read through today and like kind of figured out one of the, some of the big problems with the script that we're going back, but recreating and creating an environment for consumers to come in and enjoy this experience, right? Through Zoom, which is what everybody is using right now, right? Yep. I was ask about good remote. Yeah, I mean, like it blows your mind. Well, Zoom, the reason why Zoom works is it allows me to control a lot of variables yeah. for the consumer experience. And that's what you need, right? Because you think about going into a that's theater, great. you don't think about all the variables that are in control around you, but like all the signage to the ushers handing a program, to directing you to a seat, to telling you to be quiet, telling you to turn on your phone. Like those are all variables that the theater controls. I have to create from scratch a series of variables to create a consumer experience that's never quite been done like this before. And it, it's similar to the webinar feature of what Zoom does. And that's yeah. as far yeah. as we've kind well, of gotten. That, yeah, yeah, that's great. Right. It's like, close enough. That's right. cool. Yeah, at least you know, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> right. But and, and you could do you something could, fun, right? Yeah, like and, and I think it could be something that leads people back into the theater as well. As you start connecting and they get exposure and they see the concept, I, I think it's a it's a it's a great idea. So I mean, I, I love the the deep dive. I think it's great. Uh, I, I you know we're working on a, a small business pocket guide right about uh, about uh, partnerships right now. I'm sure you could uh, tell us a lot about that as well. It's always interesting stories. But but I do want to ask you one of our questions that we ask every guest that comes on the show, you know, it, we're really big fans of mistakes here. We, you know, we kind of consider them the foundation of, of sure. our businesses as we, as we learn and they teach us so much. And uh, looking back, you know, what would you say is 
one of the best, and I'd say that in quotes, mistakes, the one that stuck with you and taught you the most uh, as you built your business over the years? This is a rough one, right? Because this is, this is, this is, this <laughs> That's is, this why we is ask a rough it. one, right? It's <laughs> a rough one. Um, you can't have your head in the sand about the, everything, about things that are happening in your business. Meaning like mm. you can trust and love your partners, but you have to keep your eyes open. And this is true in anything. You have to keep your eyes open and make sure that everybody's doing their job. Right. And yeah. there's nothing you, you, and, and then you have to take emotion and you have to take stress and you have to take everything out of it to say, Hey, this job, this job needs to get done. And that, that same thing, the same thing is true for me, which I think one of the failings in, in my previous partnership was that I don't think that, I think that he and I were not honest with, well, we were, we were certainly honest with each other, but it's like, it's like, that honest enough standpoint of, of, you know, did we truly hold the other person accountable, right? Throughout, throughout the course of the partnership. And I would say we probably didn't enough. And so. And do you think that's, that, yeah. is that harder with creative types or do you think that's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you like, there is a part of like, you just, you, you have enough on your plate. You want to believe and you want to know that you're the other, that the other, that everybody else is doing, what they need to be doing. Right? right. Right. And, you know, but that's also, you know, we, we, five years, right. It's a good, uh, good yeah. length of time to sure. happen. Right. And so, you know, after five years in any relationship, you wake up one day and you're like, Oh, this isn't working. And like, and it hasn't been working. And John and I both had that same realization. It's like, Oh, this hasn't been working at all this year. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Oh, forget it. Like we need well, to stop doing it. You came to the realization kind of together and you know, that at least it, you know, comes up, you know, that way. So, I, th I think that's cool. So I, I also want to ask you, you know, I know there's a lot of aspiring people out there that would love to be in a business that uh, it, such as yours, that's involved in theater and creatives. And, you know, it's got to be extremely fulfilling. I think it's got to be extremely frustrating as well. But that's the, you know, the beauty of uh, small business. If there's, you know, somebody listening out there that's really just, oh, God, I want to be in this business. What, what, what advice would you give them? That, that you know to kind of make to get themselves going. So uh, I'm going to come at that question from a from a slightly different angle, right? Which is which is one of the things I I I I despise about my business, right? Is that we are very bad about selling the success of our business to the outside world, right? And oh. we live in a bubble, right? We like Broadway, off Broadway theater. It is a bubble in New York, right? And so the communication to the other other worlds, even in the city of New York, is is really limited, right? Sure. And and you constantly hear repeated, oh, don't go into theater if you don't want to make any money, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and, and, the, and the truth is, is like, that's simply not true. I mean, it is a perception of actors, not of the pe business people are working in the business, right? right? You can actually make a very good living in commercial theater and even in nonprofit theater at, at certain levels of it, which is like the 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 talent that exists in our in our business is huge but there's this perception that 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 we're all poor and broke which isn't true that kind of robs us of a, a number of, of other talent that could come in so you know i think that starting salaries within our business are way lower than they'd be anywhere else just as a function of it but as you start climbing up the ladder it gets better and better and better at a faster rate right and so i really say people coming in business like ignore that you have to pay your dues really hard in your 20s, like they're really hard pay dues paying in your 20s. But if you're good and you're competent and you're nice and you're trustworthy, the opportunities open up. But you just have to barrel through that time period. Yeah, and that's what I think it. makes it hard, which yeah. is like the cost of entry to our business is high because you're you have to figure out in a different way than you would if you were, you know, starting at JP Morgan Chase, you know, sure. in their investment, yeah. right? Coming yeah, out of, coming I mean, out of college. A right? lot of that's the same. It, it, you're right. It is fundamentally different, but there are similar uh, uh, functions that need to happen, right? You need to, you need to learn how to network with people. You need to learn how to work together with people and not have people think you're a jerk. And you, you know, like you, like you said, you need to be trustworthy and you need to prove that you are all these things. And the way that you do that is by showing up and, and being that person and doing all those, uh, all of those things long enough that now you can actually start to leverage your name for yourself. And in that sense, I think it is similar to, you know, other businesses, but you're right. The starting salaries here are the are the key that the, the key differentiator for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, it makes it it makes it tough to start out. Um, right. But like there's lots of opportunity. I think the I think the other hard thing to like for me at, at this point in my life, which is we train artists and we train how to think an artist, how to interact with artists. We're really bad about training business people. Mm-hmm. Right. And there are there are right. there aren't that many people in our industry who get that good on the job training. Um, uh, you know, and so for, as an as a producer and entrepreneur, and I came up in sales and marketing and I worked all over the place, like the hardest thing for me in the last five years is like learning how to build a business. And we didn't unfortunately do it successfully, but we did it pretty well for a while. Um, but it was, you know, when it was our first venture out of the gate, you know, as as entrepreneurs in this regard, it's like, gosh, we sure made a lot of mistakes and there was just a lack of preparation and education in our sense was like there were mistakes that never, that should have been wholly avoided that that we just blundered into. We all, yeah, we all, yeah, we all have that experience. I mean, that's great. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's 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 fascinating, uh, and and I I really appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your story. Uh, I I really look forward to connecting with you down the road, seeing how things are going uh, with your new venture. What to, what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you and to learn more about Gameotics? Um, uh, Tilted Windmills, uh, my website for the time being, uh, tiltedwindmills.net, um, gameotics.com. You can get to me there. Um, the brand name of the experience I'm building, the radio plays I'm professionally doing right now is are called Seize the Choice. And that will probably continue into live theatrical. So Great. The, if you want to be an audience member, uh, if, as we keep doing these things, you go to seize the choice.com. Uh, and, and you can sign up to be in our test audiences and people, I, I, I launched it today. So people are starting cool. to sign up now. Wow. That's and great. I can't yes. promise that any of the, I cannot promise that any of these shows that we are running right now are any good. I can't that promise they're a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. Yeah. There's no, there's yeah. no promises. It's a, you know, it's, right. it's a, it's a journey, right? So, and then we'll also uh, put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the, in the show notes. Uh, great. you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And again, I, I, you know, we really appreciate it. I've learned a lot and I'm sure Dave has, uh, it's a totally different kind of business that we've, you know, been involved in here on the show. And uh, I look forward to uh, keeping up to date with you and seeing how things are going. And, and thank you again, David. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. You bet. That was awesome, man. I, you know, yeah, I, I, the, that whole thing, we sort of glossed over it because we, we got into so many other things. But at the beginning of the episode, he talked about all the different facets of of all of his different revenue stacks, we'll call them. Yeah, right. I love that. And, yeah, and that's how you make money, right? You you find a core business, and then what can you do this to surround it? And with him, it's rights, and you know he's producing it this way and that way, and he's got it on iTunes, and he's got it here and there. And, and you got to pay for the script and do this and do that. I mean, exactly. it, it's 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 Licensing. phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah, the licensing stuff. And, you know, we talk about that a lot on the a show, lot. different ways, different revenue streams. But, you know, my naivete and not knowing anything about that theatrical, you know, business, then listening to that, I'm just like, oh, it works there too. It's the it's same. Awesome. Yeah, of course. Of course yeah. it's the same. Yeah. Fantastic. It, yeah. It, yep. It's great. It's good stuff, yeah, man. So it's cool. I'm, I, I learned a lot. Yeah, it's great. Um, you know, it, it's it's going to be interesting to see where uh, they go with Gameotics, and uh, I think it's going to be great. Hey, and before we go, I do want to thank everybody for uh, posting the reviews. We talk about them a lot on the show and how they're so important for the, our success. If you want to hear us each week, you know, uh, and uh, we've posted some other ones up there on Facebook recently that just came in. We really appreciate it. You can leave one for us at Business Show dot co slash reviews or wherever you listen to the show yeah awesome and the and then lastly again some great support thank you for uh purchasing our small business pocket guide the first one that we've released uh this guide is all about mistakes and why we think they're the foundation of your small business and the we released the uh, paperback version later, uh, or yeah, late last week, and that's selling as well now. So it's great. You can learn more at businessshow.co slash guides. It's Good fun stuff. stuff. I'm, I'm really excited about yeah. these guides. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I am too. Like, I'm excited about the one that we've got out, and I'm also excited about the next one that we're doing. So, yep. Yeah, we're making great progress, and yeah. uh, we're going to announce that here in the next couple of weeks. I think so. I think so. Cool. All right, folks, thank you so much for listening. Thanks for your reviews. Thanks for checking out our pocket guides. And uh, keep living that charmed life. See you next week.